Steven? Can Steven see it, honey? Oh, hi, Steven. You realize you're gonna be able, you're gonna be watching this film in 25 years, Steven. <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful memory of of him. He was always a kind boy. You are right. Today we're gonna be putting some skaters, and I think I see one right there. Friends would make all these videos for that, you know, that sort of stuff that kids do. Wait, I have an idea. You know, every kid loves movies, but uh, he sort of took the interest, special interest in movies. And his favorite movie was um, Fantasia. Fantasia, yeah. He had, a, he had a favorite part where the lightning bolt would sort of streak across the sky, and he'd tell you when his favorite part was coming. And, and it'd be over in a flash. Yeah. And you could sit and get two and watch that whole movie. We used to watch TV together a lot. We did that. We did a lot of watching TV together. Um, but we would watch like crappy cartoons. Yeah, I think it was just the the video and sound and the music. part. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was in the boys' choir when he was six or seven. He was in the boys' choir at five. Hey, I'm Steve. Hey, I'm Kyle. We're Stolen Signature, and we're up next on Much Does Winnipeg. Uh, we got to be a part of Much Music, Much Going Coastal. It was like the time of year where they went across to every city and put on a local show with uh, a bunch of up-and-coming bands. We were the only ones under 18. Every other band on the bill was like 18 plus. So we just figured might as well be kids about it and go shoot some golf balls. It was at the West End Cultural Center. We got to sell it out, so it was like... 400, 500 people deep. We ended up being like the fleshlings under Steve's wing. He liked the limelight. Fully convinced and I'm an absolute yeah. Dude, he can say Holy Yeah! This high school musical, um, Thoroughly Modern Millie, that's when he was Trevor Graydon, which is the male lead in that, in that play. Mm -hmm. yeah. love me. speed test and he's he, he, it's he's just remarkable in sometimes and I just think, holy mackerel, how did you do that? He was partnered with uh, someone in our class, and her name was Elena. Elaine, and they were doing a scene. The, what I understood of the scene was that he was her stepfather, and she was, she, she didn't like him, she didn't trust him or something, and that he, he basically threatened to kill her. It was completely out of his element, and I think a lot of us seeing it were surprised. Like, it, it had been getting louder and louder, and then it just, like, how you ever kill it, like, just... And it was like, whoa. He wanted to experience life now, so he was, like, not running out of time, almost. Like, he just, he didn't wait around to do shit. He would come to me with, like, three or four things on the go he'd have, and he'd just be like, I just want to fucking go, let's just do this. And I'm like, that's awesome. This guy's down to earth. He, 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 he didn't seem like he was overthinking anything. He didn't, he didn't seem like... You know, he was taking things so seriously, he was just going with the flow. He was just kind of like, in his own world, but not in a bad way. He was just like, always doing his own thing. 
it didn't really matter what else was going on. He'd just find something that he was content with doing and go for it. I felt that I was really connected to Steven in the sense of how we were so similar and, and through his friends. Or to drive to just do the things that we love to do. And he was in film too, filmmaking too, with myself, Miguel, John, Francisco, and him. But uh, we worked on it together. It was turned out I loved it. And we ended up working together a lot. We all made this film called Hazard together, which is kind of like this little goofy you know, '80s homage, like the thing. We made it, uh, made the sound amazing. Yeah, like he's the best actor. I've ever had. That's when I really started to appreciate the work he could do because Steve was an amazing sound editor. He was able to pick up just like the smallest sounds. He would tweak the settings to a point where you'd get just the crispest sounding shit. You'd never have to worry about, you know, like, ah, you know, that one voice in the back. He knew, he knew exactly what he was doing. Then at that point, I went, like, this guy's serious about film. There's a character in the film who mutates into like a creature and starts chasing this other guy around. And it's goofy. It was fun. But we're like, shit, what are we gonna do for like all the goo and shit and all the other like pussy mutated stuff? He's like, oh, I got that. And he's got like this oatmeal and food colors and all the other shit. And he just, like, it was awesome. Like, he would just have shit covered. Like, on set, he was just like, no nonsense, let's fucking go, let's do this, let's just go, let's just go. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. He would spend hours and hours on his computer, you know, finding clips, uh, making clips. I remember there being a m multiple times where I was, like, editing, and I was like, man, this sounds like shit. And he would legit just come over and, like, start, he's like, okay, now it's fixed, and we'll just leave. There was the sci-fi one that he did, The Winter. All the aliens and like the last days on Earth and stuff. That one was cool because I was like the hero of the story. I needed to see what it was. I got to work with Steve and do all of the sound and music production and sound effects. She was his final project for that year of school. Get your sister. The one with the cheating girlfriend. Did you see that one? You know, they take over a room upstairs and they arrange the furniture. And... We were just talking, and he was saying how he's not sure if he's going to have enough people for like the whole thing. And I was just like, dude, if you need someone, I'll try. What time is it? <clears throat> time to get it on. Oh shit! Here. Just the whole storyline and me being like the guy that the girl's sleeping with it was all just really funny. They just needed a shot of like a really like quick, fast escape that makes no sense. So, so they got the body and just tossed her out the window. They got it in like two takes too. The perfect fall. Our neighbors were telling us that they looked and, and this body was flying out the window, kept flying out the window and they didn't... <laughs> Eventually, they all knew he was working on his films, you know, because the lights, they had lights and stuff going on. And mm -hmm. But the first time, it was sort of, oh, what's going on there? Even then, like, the way he did his color correction and the way he would line shots up, you just were like, shit. Like, he really was like a one-man army when it came to filmmaking. It was really impressive. And, like, I didn't let him know that enough. It's, I think it's because I never got to know him, and I never had the opportunity to understand someone that was so similar to me. I mean, that's that's half the reason why I won the scholarship was because we were such similar people and we had such a drive to do the things we love to do. Even though I didn't know this guy that well, I let all of my performances be inspired in a sort of way by just like his dry humor or <laughs> like, I don't know, it was just, just taking risks and putting yourself out there doing something out of your element was very, I tried to do that, and I think subconsciously it, it had to do with because I was kind of feeling it from what he did, because what I saw him do. You know, I would see him doing great shit, and I'd just be like, you yeah, know, cool. And I, I should have told him more often, you know, because near the end when Miguel and I and Luke and a bunch of us were like, let's put together a team and let's like start making shit. Yeah, it was around the time that, you know, he, he wasn't there anymore, so. And there was someone at the back door, and I thought it was Stephen S. friends in, and there was the police. So, um, um, it was really awful.
and they, I told them I didn't want to know, don't tell me, don't tell me, I can't do this, and then, and then um, one of them told me, I said, I asked this one woman, is he alive, and she said, no ma'am, he's not, and then I uh, screamed and screamed and crawled around in the snow, and the neighbors all came out, and I yelled at them to go away, and It was really awful. It was really awful. It was awful. And uh, I was like, I was like, what's going on? What, what, what happened? And and my my mom, my mom said Stephen's gone, or my dad said Stephen's gone, and I was like, what do you mean Stephen's gone? And then my mom said Stephen's gone. She was sobbing, and she said Stephen's gone. And I said, what do you mean he's gone? And she said, and then my dad said, Stephen died. And I was like, what do you mean? He died? like, how, what, what, what happened? And then my um, dad said that he killed himself. And, and, or, and, and I, I think I screamed. Uh, and yeah, I screamed like really loud. I was sitting next to, I'm sitting between my, fr I, I, I screamed and I was sitting next to my friend Doug. Um, and, um, and then, and he sort of like, I felt, I sort of felt like I was like actually literally being ripped in half. Before he, um, decided to do suicide, uh, he ended up, uh, I think he called Milen, uh, is what I've been hearing. I reached out to someone before he died and she yeah. was here and, yeah. and she was here with the police. I didn't know that at the time, but. She was in the front with the police, and um, I was in the back with the police. Uh, I just assumed she was nuts, so she like took his phone and just started sending out this like prank text, like, oh, he's dead, and I'm like, fuck you, like, who the fuck are you? And then it kind of clarified it. Um, I got a text from Miguel, and I like looked over, and I was like, oh, fuck. And he says, like, Steve's gone. And I was like, what do you mean? Because that's all he said, I guess he was still kind of, he just wanted to get the word out, you know, like, Steve's gone, you know. And I was like, what the hell, you know, and I called him right away, I was like, what do you mean Steve's gone? He's like, dude, Steve, like, Steve's gone. Uh, Derek told me first, I got home from work, I told my parents, and then right after that, I started getting calls from a couple other people trying to see if it was true and stuff. Um, I think it spread pretty fast. There wasn't pretty. There wasn't really anyone that was left in the dark. I was sitting at my desk here, and it was, I believe, early December, and um, three or four of his good friends from class came by to see me, and they told me about it. And uh, I mean, needless to say, I was shocked. So I started reading through the comments that were on the post, and I read the obituary, and I was like, "Yeah, it was him." And I'm just like, "Oh my God!" Like, I, I didn't even like. I mean, it was too, like it was. Well, I found out later it was two days after his death that she posted it on the Facebook page. And I remember coming back to class after the winter break, and I walked into class late. I remember that very distinctly. I walked into class late, and everyone was sitting in a circle. And our teacher, Karen Moore, was crying. And a lot of people were tearing up in the circle, like, "What is going on?" And at that time, my, my scene partner, uh, Sarah, took me outside and she said, uh, Stephen, Stephen passed away. And uh, it was just sort of a really big, like a, a step back, because it was out of nowhere. You know, it's a complicated thing. We have no answers. Yeah, there aren't, there aren't answers, really. We just have broken hearts. Yeah. Right? We can take yeah. a break. It's okay. What's it like making a documentary about suicide? Um, uh, that's a good question, actually. Straight up. Uh, 
I think it's important that people share what's going on with their lives. Like, like I think we live in this generation now where people are too afraid to put what they, how they feel out in the world, like with Facebook and shit like that. People being like, oh, my day, and, crap. and like the criticisms that come with that and the stigma. I think people are afraid to tell each other what's going on nowadays, you know, and there's less and less circles of people sharing how they feel and what they're going through, you know, and I think it sucks because people need to communicate. It's important. It's what we used to do. It's what we should still be doing, you know? Uh, what, what did you feel as you were making this, making a documentary about Susa? What did you learn? Um, if I should pass the tomb of Jonah, I would stop there and sit for a while because I was swallowed one time deep in the dark and came out alive after all. You start learning that the things that you love aren't permanent. And so you stop loving and trying to protect yourself. And once you do that, it's hard to start again. I guess, I guess I have a hard time answering this question because in the end this documentary isn't about suicide. And I guess it is kind of about Stephen Hurst, but in the end it's about something even bigger than that. So the mystery of our collective human life, our social life, lies at least in part in this question of what it means to reach out and to be connected to someone and in the reaching out and being connected to be at risk of losing the connection. It's about us being connected and being together and, and knowing and valuing each other and being aware of everybody around. And not just like surface level, just going about life, like, um, I don't know, checking people's Facebook statuses or just going on the bus without even talking to anybody. Like, it's like you look at the bus and like everybody's just like crammed into a sardine thing uh, and <laughs> rarely talk, talking to one another. And th you'd be surprised if, if someone ends up just talking to you randomly. Um, actually, there is this random woman once, she just started talking to me on the bus. She started talking about uh, suicide in relation to uh, valuing human life and everything. I was like, this is crazy. Like, I'm doing a documentary on this right now. I'm thinking this in my head, like, oh, maybe I should just interview, like, right now. And so, I just pulled out my iPhone and then started talking to her. <laughs> People's lives are important. You can always talk to people, and, uh, I just don't like it when people commit Broadway suicide. Family. It bothers me in ways people should care. Especially the government, too, in certain ways, you know? People should talk, care about one another, you know? Be more respect. You know? Don't uh, keep things inside, you know? Talk to somebody, Broadway. you know? So things That's are bothering hurting. you, you know? There should be more love, too, you know, with one another, you know? It's tragic. Just talk to people, you know? There's help out there. You can always talk to people, you know? I, after doing that, I start talking to more people on the bus, or in general, or just waiting for the next bus. Maybe buses are kind of like a metaphor for how we should be approaching life. Everyone has their own struggles and um, problems that they have to encounter in life and it's just a matter of sharing that with people and figuring out how how to go about talking to each other and sharing and communicating and, and being being a community. Like we need we need to be tighter and we need to love each other, you know? I still miss men. I still yeah, want them to it. come home. You're gonna be watching this film in 25 years, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you